Welcome, dear friends and supporters of the Afar Nation. My name is Ariel Magnet, and I'm thrilled to be your MC again this year. And I want to thank you so much for attending this year's EANC conference. This gathering brings together distinguished guests from various Eritrean opposition groups and experts who will consider pathways forward for the democratic transition of Eritrea. Our agenda today includes presentations by activists as well as experts. We also have some fun for you, including delicious Afar cuisine and a cultural presentation hosted by the local Afar community. Among key points for our discussion this evening are establishing an autonomous Dinkalia within a united, decentralized Eritrea, facilitating dialogue with international and regional stakeholders to promote this cause, the role of the diaspora in promoting Afar autonomy, and the shape of Eritrea's future democracy. Just before calling on speakers, I want to acknowledge and thank Afar friends who are joining us through Zoom today. I want to acknowledge especially the appreciated presence of Mr. Nagash Osman, Chairman Eritrea National Council for Democratic Change, Mr. Nuradin Abdukalir, rights activist and friend of the Afar, Mr. Gareb Burhadir, National Representative, Council of Eritrea, Mr. Jonas Waldu, Biotech Yakal, Teddy Meng Sab from Fasil, Abdurrahman Bohashim, human and political rights activist. After the speakers, we will also have a Q&A section. We also have a statement of solidarity from Mr. Tekber Bayani. I will call on Angie to read this much appreciated demonstration of support. Our next speaker is Joseph Elliott Magnet, one of Canada's most respected constitutional lawyers. He is a professor of law at the University of Ottawa. He has acted counsel in more than 200 constitutional cases in the Supreme Court of Canada. He has been lead counsel for the Government of Canada in Supreme Court of Canada Appeals, advisor to the Canadian Federal, Provincial, and Territorial Governments on constitutional matters. He was elected to the Royal Society of Canada in 1998. Thank you so much. Matt. He will now do his presentation. Thank you, uh, Ariel, for that warm introduction. Uh, Ariel did forget one important thing about my accomplishment, which is that uh, I am her father. Thanks for inviting me and asking me to share with you thoughts about the role of the diaspora in Eritrea's transition away from dictatorship. That is to say, about your role. It's my honor and my privilege to be among my Afar friends again. I just want everybody to know that uh, Ahmed, Warren, and I continue to work on your issues, on Afar issues, and we will continue to do this on your behalf as we have for the past 14 years. I begin with uh, Ali Marco backwards, please. Thank you. With uh, Ali Mara Hanferi, the Sultan of Ausa. He was a very strong defender of Afar land rights and an opponent to the uh, dictatorship, the Soviet backed dictatorship of the Derg. In 1975, that dictatorship tried to capture him uh, by a bloody raid on Asaita. He escaped. And in exile, Sultan Hanfari provided very important resistance to the dirt, particularly on issues of Afar land rights, Afar autonomy. He returned in 1991 when the dirt was overthrown. It's inspiring that his influence in exile as a diaspora leader was critical the transitions that took place in Ethiopia and Eritrea in 1991. And I begin with him because he stands as an inspiration to us, to you, 
as diaspora leaders of an oppressed people inside of Eritrea. What we learn from him is that the diaspora role, your role, is critical to Eritrea's transition. Eritrea has one of the largest diasporas in the world, measured by percentage of citizens living outside of the country. Between one-third and one-half of all Eritrean nationals live outside in the diaspora. This huge diaspora is not uniform. One million Eritreans, out of a total population of three million, fled the country during the liberation struggle. According to Eritrea law, they and their offspring, their children, uh, are Eritrea nationals. During the liberation struggle, the vanguard, the Eritrean People's Liberation Front, mobilized this diaspora for the war effort. The Eritrean diaspora provided substantial funds and substantial political cover with uh, the nations of the world for the liberation fight. They promoted cultural events and festivals to mobilize this diaspora. And they also promoted something that we can feel here in this room, an emotional sense of belonging, of community, and it was built on Eritrean nationalism. The most important of these festivals was the Bologna Festival, which you can see on this slide. Uh, this is how the government promoted identification with the liberation struggle. Next slide. Next. Thank you. Uh, that 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 was a, a video that took place uh, in 1989 at the Bologna Festival. You can see that uh, people were very very enthused, but they really became enthused in 1991 when the incredible victory of the liberation fight fighters uh, succeeded in overthrowing uh, the Soviet dictatorship uh, in Ethiopia and also the liberation struggle in Eritrea brought to power the national liberation fighters. This made people dizzy with joy and hope. And again, the regime reached out to the diaspora. The diaspora responded. Over one million Eritreans in the diaspora paid voluntarily the 2% diaspora tax, which the regime asked for. And this provided one-third of the regime's gross national product. It provided one-third of the resources available to the Eritrean government. Diaspora Eritreans took great pride in their nationality. They considered themselves deeply patriotic, and they wore their Eritrean nationality as a badge of honor and identity. Who wouldn't? They had just defeated the second largest military in the history of the world. They were heroes who had delivered the people from bondage, and the superhero who made it all possible was Isaias F. Worky. The Eritrean diaspora transformed after 1997. That was the year the Constitutional Commission of Eritrea presented its work to the Eritrean National Assembly. 
President Afwerki refused to implement the Constitution. From 1998 to 2000, he had a justification. There was a war with Ethiopia, a devastating war. But after the war, in 2001, criticism of Afwerki spread inside Eritrea and also inside the diaspora communities. In 2001, inside Eritrea, Afwerki arrested the most important of these critics. He closed the universities, eliminated the free press, prohibited opposition parties, prohibited dissent, and imposed deep repression upon Eritrean society. There were no elections. There were and is no legislature, no independent courts, no independent civil society organizations, no independent media. Eritrea became, at that time and until today, one of the most repressive regimes in the history of world politics. At the same time, Eritrea continued to embrace the diaspora through the festivals. That quirky reached out to try to uh, animate the diaspora by creating the youth PFDJ. And it had some modest success in mobilizing well-meaning diaspora youth, as you can see on the slide, to stand patriotically with the government of Eritrea. Most of these youth have never set foot in Eritrea. They are in the western countries and some of their enthusiasm for Eritrean nationalism is motivated by the racism they face in their home countries, embracing identity as nationals of a heroic uh, liberation uh, movement uh, is understandable uh, in the circumstances they face. In 2002, Eritrea introduced a program to turn the Eritrean workforce into unpaid conscripts, forcing them to work as slave labor on state-owned projects like this, the Bisha Mine, which started to create resources for the regime. Refugees who found their way to Canada including this man, Cassetti, claimed damages for slavery and crimes against humanity in the Canadian courts. The Supreme Court of Canada found these claims credible and allowed the claims to proceed to trial, at which point uh, the sponsoring mine paid damages for slavery and crimes against humanity to uh, this man and many hundreds like him to avoid a trial. Following this program, a mass exodus from Eritrea followed. Twenty percent of the population fled into other countries as refugees. They were no longer enthusiastic supporters of the regime, quite the reverse. They were bitter Eritrean dissidents. The repression after 2001 diminished support from the regime among the old diaspora, the ones who had been energized by the festivals. You can see this in the declining gross domestic product uh, after 2001, if you keep in mind that one-third of the regime's resources at this time came from the diaspora the diaspora stopped contributing voluntarily. Uh, a variety of opposition groups, like the EANC, emerged in the di diaspora. Civil society organizations, human rights groups, youth groups, all regime opponents. Some of the old diaspora members 
moved into the new opposition diaspora movements. The chief characteristic of this new diaspora, of which you're part, is opposition to the regime. While the festivals continue to promote the regime to the shrinking old diaspora, the new diaspora is increasingly mobilized. And recently, as you will see, the diaspora has become violent, attacking the old regime supporters. Chaos erupting at what was supposed to be a family-friendly event. A festival celebrating Canada's Eritrean community. Instead, structures toppled, barricades broken down. Nine were injured. This uh, attack on the uh, festivals by the new diaspora youth is something that occurred all around the world, in Sweden, in Canada, in Germany, in the United States, in Australia. Notwithstanding their common opposition to the regime, the opposition parties could not and do not hold together. They continually fragment, amalgamate, split. Uh, here's a list of them today. And here's the point. They are not effective. They pose no real challenge to the regime. Scholars have studied this. Here are two of the studies about the Eritrean diaspora. And they've reached some conclusions about it. The most important conclusion is that the diaspora has failed to present a credible alternative to the dictatorship. Virtually all of the experts agree with this conclusion. There are three additional causes that account for the diaspora's weak and ineffective role today. Divisions along ethnic, regional, and religious lines, constant bickering among them, and a very poor reputation within the uh, internal Eritrean population. So I'm asking you, people in this room, people uh, watching us on Zoom, are we going to turn a blind eye to our ineffectiveness? I'm asking you, are we going to allow this situation to continue? Diasporas can be mobilized by memory, by myth, by longing for real and imagined community. I would go to, you can't really hear. Um, but memory and longing for community are not really enough for diasporas to be effective. For diasporas to be effective, they have to find a way to speak with a common voice to the powers that matter. It's all about unity. It's all about saying the same thing over and over. It's about having a common vision, sticking to it, and advocating for it. That is the hard reality, and that is something we do not now presently do. This is what we have to work on here. We need to form a common set of principles and a common vision for the future and stick to it. This requires give and take, tact, diplomacy, and compromise. We have to engage in that vision building process with our colleagues and other nationalities and we have to make those compromises and stick to them. We have to unite, meaning we have to negotiate a common vision and stick by it. 
how far people have worked hard for the last generation to set out and defend a way forward for Eritrea that will have benefits for all. As Ahmed explained, we've reached out for the past 15 years to other Eritrean nationalities all around the world to explain and defend the AFAR model. We have invited other nationalities to join hands with us uh, and tried to promote a vision of a democratic uh, Eritrean federation based on the rule of law, democracy, equality of all nationalities. We've engaged in deep dialogue with them to listen to their concerns, to find what matters to them, and to try to compromise so that we can unite against the dictatorship. We reached out in Addis in 2011. Uh, and uh, we were rewarded with some of the nationalities, particularly the smaller nationalities, agreeing with us and joining and signing uh, a united vision for an AFAR. Some of the other nationalities were a little more hesitant and needed some more discussion and uh, information. And we stand ready to provide that. We reached out, we gathered in 2012 a national conference and invited uh, the most important representatives of the other nationalities to it, along with ambassadors and uh, decision makers to explain the AFAR concerns, to listen to the concerns of others, to forge and unite behind a common vision. We reached out to the author of the 1997 Constitution, Professor Baraket uh, Habti Selassie. Uh, he produced a constitution for the regime, a highly centralized, Stalinist, Soviet-inspired model, um, which found favor with the PFDJ. He was, a, he was an agent of the PFDJ, engaged by them. We reached out to him, we invited him, and we explained our concerns with this model to him. And we, again, were rewarded by uh, having from him agreement that the Constitution he drafted was not the right model for Eritrea, that a centralized a system for a con country composed of diverse nationalities wouldn't work. And he was willing to join hands with us to uh, consider more decentralized models for Eritrea. The model we have in mind is something that Ahmed has explained. Uh, having rule of law, democracy, the quality of nationalities, power sharing in autonomous regions, indigenous rights all protected, as well as uh, the uh, human rights and fundamental freedoms uh, uh, in its constitution. That's the model. Um, I explained it. I'm putting its basic elements here on this slide for you and the document is circulating uh, for you to see it in writing. The model uh, is supported by intensive work, incredible development uh, in my discipline, comparative constitutional law, uh, over the past generation. Uh, what we've discovered in my discipline um, is what makes states with diverse models stable, peaceful, and secure are these uh, decentralized models with autonomy for interior nations. And this is the basis of the AFR model. The AFR people, whoop, let me go back one there. 
I think we want to go back one. Back. Back. Thank you. The Amphire uh, people are indigenous to Eritrea. This is a finding of uh, independent experts who have examined the question. And as indigenous peoples, they are endowed with indigenous rights, including the right to self-determination and autonomy. Um, Alan mentioned to you the UN DRIP, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I'm just putting in front of you uh, the authority, Article 3, which confer the right to self-determination upon indigenous peoples like the Afar. Uh, also, experience is taught that uh, autonomy for interior nations and indigenous peoples is not only a good model for diverse states like Eritrea, but the only model that works. And this is something that has been adopted by every, virtually every country uh, that has diverse populations around the world. So the original FR model was set out in, as Ahmed said, a declaration in Samar in 2011 and signed by 2,600 people, including the uh, leaders of the Afar state, the leaders of the refugees, the traditional leaders, the leaders of Waredas, uh, and uh, some 2,000 ordinary Afar people. It was reaffirmed in other declarations uh, from Addis, to uh, in Sweden, to the United States, and we present it again to you to consider here. We think it's the right model. We want to discuss it with other nationalities. We want to explain why it's the right model, not for us only, but for them. And we want to unite behind a common vision. Why? Because it's the only way for you, the diaspora, to be effective. Thank you for inviting me. I look forward to your questions and our discussion. Thank you so much.